own lives, that they will grow up knowing you and loving you and have a desire to serve you. So bless those who are teaching them and bless us now, we pray. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Under pressure. Well, when was the last time you put uh, air in your tires and checked the pressure? When was the last time you went to the doctors and, told, and was told you had high blood pressure? In sports, athletes often say, I can perform to my peak under pressure. That separates the good from the bad. When life is busy, we say, I'm feeling so much pressure. And at school and at work, as we mentioned earlier, sometimes it is peer pressure. Uh, that uh, pressure to conform. Now, pressure can work for us or against us. And in our passage today, the church will be put under pressure. But notice, it's a very different pressure to what they faced last week. Last week, in verses 1 to 16, in the story of Ananias and Sapphira, the pressure came from within the church. In today's reading, the pressure comes from outside the church. So last week, pressure from within. This week, pressure or opposition from outside forces. And it will come via the religious authorities. Now, did you notice as we read the passage together, it is full of places, full of places. I did uh, hear the story of the man who went into a restaurant and read the sign on the menu that said this, they serve breakfast at any time. So he ordered a full English in the reign of Charles II. <laughs> places. Where would you go? If you go anywhere in the world, what place would you like to end up in tonight? Barcelona, nice evening meal, looking over the skyline of Barcelona. Maybe out to the jungles of South America. Maybe, where would you go if you go anywhere in the world? And if you say, I'd rather be at home, you need a life. (laughs) This is full of places. Last week we noted Solomon's Colonnade. That's where the action took place. It was quite impressive, a long porch stretching along the eastern side of the temple courtyard. It was a contrast. It was fantastic architecture, and yet the bulk of the people there were disabled, were ill, afflicted with all kinds of diseases. It had the blind, the lame, the crippled. Because wherever you find a religious site, you find the outs, well, the rejects of society as they were in Bible days. Begging, hoping that someone who was religious might give them money. And I don't think I've ever been to a religious building anywhere in the world and not seen beggars outside. And so it was a magnificent structure uh, architecturally, but it was full of, uh, well, not pleasant people to look at, for want of a word. A cross between cardboard city and a general hospital. But this chapter is full of places. So let's move on from the colonnade to the jail. And the first point I want to bring to you is there was joy in the jail. Joy in the jail. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. Now I've been to prison on many occasions. Um, Not as a criminal, but as a preacher and minister I've been invited in to take services in chapels for the prisoners and two things you'll notice if ever you go into prison to take a service one it is always full everyone wants to get out of their cells they'll even put up with a preacher and two they are appreciative you will always get a round of applause and almost every pre- every prisoner comes up and shakes you by the hand they'll tell you what they think of it But they'll look you in the eye, they will say thank you for that, and then they'll tell you whether they thought it was rubbish or good or whatever. Now when you go into prison, despite what the media suggests, it is not a holiday camp. They are depressing places, and when the doors are slammed behind you, it is a horrible sound and the keys are locked. And then the prisoners come in in their drab grey uniforms, and you just look at it and you think, how depressing is this place? And if it's depressing today, how much more depressing was it 2,000 years ago to be shoved down a hole and none of the comforts that modern prisoners may face? So we have a contrast here between them, the, the architecture of the colonnade and the grey walls or the dirt walls of a prison cell. 
And another contrast, in the colonnade, they were in the air, fresh air. They were in a building. They could mix and mingle. They could proclaim Christ. In prison, their opportunities are limited, almost zero. And it seems to the casual reader that someone has put the brakes on them and their activities. Or have they? Confined to a public jail. But we're going to see God's will is still being done, even in a jail. Alfred Hitchcock, the famous film director, he always appears in every film he made. If ever you see an old Alfred Hitchcock film, he, he's always there. He may just be in the, the background of a scene walking across a zebra crossing. He may walk out of a shop as the main character goes in. But for one split second in every Hitchcock movie, he's there. So next time you get to see one of his films, keep an eye out for him. By contrast, Shakespeare appeared in none of his plays. But he is the hidden genius behind all the characters, behind every twist of every plot, the genius behind every poignant ending. You can kind of sense his fingerprints all over the story and the script, even though visibly he's not there. Now for these apostles, God's fingerprints are all over this story. His presence is there. He's going to be at work, even though they can't visibly see him. The brakes are not on, it's just a different avenue, a different chapter they are going through. And all through this chapter, in every impossible situation, God will intervene. When they're in a colonnade full of sick people, God brings healing. When they are prisoners locked up in jail, God sends an angelic creature and he brings freedom. God intervenes when they least expect it. So there is joy in the jail. They're not depressed. This is not the end. It's just a diversion. And it's only temporary. Secondly, the temple courts. There is teaching in the temple. Verse 21 to 26. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told and began to teach the people. Again, a different location from jail to the temple and they return full of excitement and full of joy. It's good to be excited, isn't it? It's good to be full of joy. Outside of a garden centre, someone had put this sign up on the wall. It's spring. We're so excited. We wet our plants. Hey, it's good to be excited. The sun is shining. Life is good. You've got health. You've got freedom. You've got opportunities that people in other parts of the world can only dream of. These folks go back and they're excited. They've seen the power of God firsthand. An angelic being opened the prison door and they were let out. Now, I've never encountered an angelic being. Well, not that I know of. I think I may have, I don't know if they were just, you might say, coincident. People who were there at the right time at the right place. I tend to think they may have been angels and I was unaware in the sense that they looked normal. But I've had help in, in certain situations that there's no human explanation why it came. Maybe it was an angel, maybe it wasn't, who knows. But these people know, they know, this was a supernatural creature that God sent to deliver them. And he instructs them as well. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. Now, language is always changing. And our translation of the Bible is always being updated. And they revise the New International Version that we use every so many years. And when they last revised it, I don't quite like the improvement. Because the older, the previous version of the NIV, before it was revised, translated verse 20 this way. And tell the people the full message. Tell the people the full message. The King James Bible translates it, tell the people all the words of this life. All the words of this life. The full message. Don't just give them half of it, give it them all. They might not like it all, but you give it them anyway. Don't just tell them what you think they want to hear. This is the message and you don't compromise on it. You don't water it down. You give it to them as you've been given it. 
Stephen Gort Roger is a, a, a great speaker and a good author. He's written some good Bible commentaries. And he says this. So much of this account contrasts with church life today. They were bold, direct, rude, and produced a commotion wherever they went. We are often timid, evasive, overly polite, and produce a stifled yawn wherever we go. These folks rush back to the temple, full of joy, full of confidence, full of faith. We would say they're on a spiritual high. They couldn't wait to share the message of Jesus. But not everyone was happy. The jailers and their religious officials had the opposite emotion to the apostles, and so they had them rearrested. It's a bit like a yo-yo for the apostles, isn't it? Up and down, up and down, up and down. And so from teaching in temple, we're back to the courtroom, and we have courage before the court. Courage before the court. Verse 27. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin, to be questioned by the high priest. Now, although the building isn't mentioned by name, we know exactly where they are by that word Sanhedrin. The Sanhedrin was the highest court in Jewish affairs. They controlled civil and religious laws. They pulled the strings. And at this time in history, the Sanhedrin was at its most powerful. They, they had peaked as far as their influence and power was concerned. So they were the final word on civil and religious law. They did have limited power. The one thing they couldn't do was to kill someone. They had to go to the Romans and get permission and let the Romans do the execution if the Romans agreed with them. But apart from uh, capital punishment, they could do almost every other uh, bit of ruling past whatever law they wanted to. Now the apostles are brought before the court and they are cross-examined in verse 27, 28. What's the charge? Verse 28 says, we gave you strict orders not to teach in this name. Now did you get their language? This name. They won't even say it. Last Sunday night I was preaching on Luke 15, the story of the prodigal son. And this so reminded me of that incident because when the younger brother comes home and the father and the family are all rejoicing, his brother's out in the field, full of jealousy and pride and hatred. He won't come in. And when the father goes to him and says, look, your son's come home, he says, that, that son of yours. He won't call him that brother of mine. It's that son of yours. I'll have nothing to do with him. I won't even mention his name. He's, he's your son. He's not my brother. And here, they won't even mention the name Jesus, that name. That's what you're teaching in. And the charge is against them. You have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. In other words, you disobeyed us. We told you not to do it. And you've gone out there and deliberately done it. And if that wasn't bad enough, look what they say. You are making us guilty of this man's blood. In other words, you're blaming us for killing Jesus. Well, at least they understood the message. They got the gospel, didn't they? That's what Peter said in Acts chapter 2 when he stood up and preached the very ser first sermon. You men of Israel, you handed him over. You are guilty. Of course, it is a little bit sensitive when you talk about who killed Jesus. Jews have been persecuted as the Christ killers in previous generations and still are in some countries. Who killed Jesus? I, I think if you talk about who killed Jesus, think of the cross. Let me illustrate it. Here's one I made earlier. And uh, when you think of a cross today, when you think of a cross, you've got four parts to the cross. And I think when it comes to who killed Jesus, there are four groups responsible. One part, think of the Jews. They did the deed by handing Jesus over. No doubt about that. These religious leaders passed the law. They, they trumped up charges and took him to Pilate and they handed him over. They were guilty of the death of Jesus. But Peter in his sermon said, you with the hands of wicked men. That's the second group, the Romans. 
wasn't just the Jews, it was the Romans who did the execution. They were guilty. But then there's a third group, humanity, because the Bible says Christ died for our sins, for the sins of the world. We're all responsible for his death because it was your sin and my sin he bore on the cross. And then there's a fourth dimension, God himself. And Isaiah in his prophecy in chapter 53 says, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. And it was the Lord who chastised him. It was the Lord who placed upon him the sins of the world. And so you have four dimensions to the cross. Who killed Jesus? Yes, the Jews were involved. Yes, the Romans, the Gentiles were involved. Yes, humanity was involved. But it was all part of God's plan. He turned men's wickedness for our good. So it's never straightforward who killed Jesus. But when we think of the cross, we get the four aspects of why Christ died. Now, for the apostles here, it is very much deja vu. In Acts chapter 4, they were told, don't go telling people about Jesus. And they went out and told people about Jesus. And here in Acts chapter 5, exactly the same. And the same response, we must obey God rather than man. And then Peter gives the Sanhedrin an answer they did not want to hear. In civil law, fine. But when it comes to religious law, there is a higher authority than you. God always trumps your laws and your restrictions. And the word in verse 29, we must obey, is a very unusual word. It means exclusive obedience. It's only used a couple of times in the New Testament. Exclusive and obedience. We don't question what God says, we just do it. That's the idea. And then he presents to these religious leaders the good news concerning Jesus. He's very wise. In verse 30, he says, The God of our ancestors, the God of our fathers. Look, this isn't a new message. This is the message your ancestors, your forefathers. You've always had this message. But you've been blind, blinkered to it. Lift the blinkers and see, this is the same message you've always had. And he tells them three things God has done in Jesus. Verse 30, God raised Jesus from the dead when you killed him by nailing to a cross. Second, God has exalted Jesus to his right hand. Verse 31. He is now a prince and a saviour. In Grand Prix language, he's on the podium. He's taken the applause. He's won. He's victor. And then thirdly, verse 32. God has given us his spirit to those who obey him. And then Peter really sets the cat among the pigeons by saying, we are witnesses of these things we saw it happen we are testifying but he also says God's Holy Spirit is a witness and testifies and then verse 33 we have the reaction of the Sanhedrin see when Peter says that we're witnesses of the truth in fact God is a witness through his spirit of the truth he is one raw nerve too many they couldn't handle it and they become angry ferocious furious and they want to execute them. And they would have if it wasn't for one man. In verse 45, verse 40, sorry, verse 34. A man called Gamaliel. Once again, they're in an impossible situation. God rescues them. When they've got a colonnade full of sick people, God brings healing. When they're trapped in a prison, God brings freedom. When it looks like their life's going to be taken from them, God sends Gamaliel. One man to change the situation. God works through an unbeliever called Gamaliel. Another Pharisee. Someone who was respected. We'll meet him later on in Acts chapter 22 because the Apostle Paul learned under him. Was an apprentice to Gamaliel. Chapter 22 verse 3 tells us. A kindly man, more tolerant than his peers... And he stands up and speaks for the victims. And in verse 34, he diffuses the situation in two ways. 
First of all, he says that these apostles, get them out of here. He removes them from sight. Because as long as they're there, the Pharisees will see them and they'll be full of hate towards them. As soon as you remove them, everyone calms down. Very wise, Gamaliel. And then second, he goes to reason, not emotion. Reason, not emotion. And he brings in the case of Judas and Judas, who, like Jesus, rose up. Like Jesus, people said, they're the Messiah, let's follow them. Like Jesus, they died, but unlike Jesus, they stayed dead. They never rose again. They never ascended on high. They never changed the world. But notice verse 40. They actually listened to Gamaliel. His speech spares the life of the apostles. So what happens? They are whipped, they are beaten and released. And if they do it according to the law, Deuteronomy 25, 3, 39 lashes. 39 lashes and released. So they got their freedom, but there's a price to pay. That will sort them out. Let's see them preach now. And what we're told? They are heralding in the homes. It's the only word I could get to arrive. It's an old-fashioned word, heralding. They were proclaiming, they were preaching, they were witnessing, they were speaking in the home. And these two verses, 41 and 42, are quite incredible. Instead of squashing the, the, the apostle spirits, they give them a good beating. Instead of them just licking their wounds and feeling sorry for themselves, they are patched up. And we are told day after day in the temple courts from house to house, they never stop teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. How can they do it? God was with them. You know, I, I'm off to Speaker's Corner after this and there's a, a little lady there called Hatton Tash. She's only about five and a half feet. Little Turkish lady who was converted from Islam to Christianity. They even... One night she was walking down the road and five men jumped out and beat her up because she converted. They broke her leg. They broke her ribs. Do you know what she did the next Sunday? She went straight back to Speaker's Corner in plaster, in pain and witnessed. I've seen her being punched and she's always back the next week. And she comes into mind when I read about these disciples beaten up and yet she's got the courage to go back and stare at the very people who beat her up, who broke a leg, who broke her ribs, and witness. These folks had that courage and enthusiasm. This is an important message, and we will make sure it is heralded from house to house. They have to go into the homes. The church couldn't survive just in the colonnade. It was too big. 5,000 people meeting together. You know, any big church, take the one down the road there. Do you know how they survive? Not just on Sundays. They need smaller groups, house groups. Otherwise, you build up no relationships, no accountability. You can sneak in and sneak out. It is the smaller groups that bring the cement in the brickwork. And if we're going to survive as a church, it won't just be by meeting on a Sunday. Otherwise, we're just a club we attend once a week. We need to be part of smaller groups, house groups, when we can pray together and share together and learn together. And I appeal to anyone on camera or in the building, if you're not part of a house group, be one. We need each other from house to house. They never stop teaching and proclaiming. So they use the homes not just to teach and build one another up. They use the homes evangelistically to proclaim the gospel. And again, house meetings are nothing new. When I go to Moldova in November, we will meet in homes and proclaim the gospel. You meet where people are, where people are comfortable, where people will come. And that's what they did here in the book of Acts. So it's a place, it's a story or a chapter all about different places. Some were favorable to the apostles, some were not. But they kept true to their convictions. And whatever their circumstances, God used them. Let's pray. Lord, forgive us when we feel sorry for the rough deal life has given us. Forgive us when we are overwhelmed by situations. 
and circumstances. Help us to find strength in you. Lord, we are frail human beings. In some ways, it is natural for us to be fearful. It is natural for us to look inward. It is natural for us to struggle. But Lord, may we know your strength, the filling of your spirit. May we know the joy and the boldness that these apostles had to declare, to speak for Christ, whatever our situation, whatever our um, a building or, or place we find ourselves in. Lord, help us to make it count. So apply these words to each, to every heart, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't you go talking about Jesus. Who else would